Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this webinar entitled The Basic Fetal Heart Scan, a Systematic Approach to Screening for Congenital Heart Disease, presented by Michelle Perez. The AIUM is accredited by the ACCME. This webinar is designated for one AMA PRA Category 1 credit. By the conclusion of this webinar, participants should be able to discuss current guidelines and evaluation for basic fetal heart screening, review normal sonographic features and appearance of the fetal heart, identify the sonographic appearance of abnormalities, and describe imaging optimization techniques and pitfalls. As an ACCME accredited provider, it is the AIUM's policy to ensure that the contents and quality of this activity are balanced, independent, objective, and scientifically rigorous. All individuals who are in a position to control the content of an educational activity are required to complete a disclosure form. All disclosures are reviewed by the AIUM and any conflicts of interest are resolved or managed prior to an activity. Michelle Perez and Darcy Belito de Luna have no disclosures. At the conclusion of this webinar, you will be able to access the CME test and evaluation located on the AIUM website. Participants who complete the post-test with a grade of 70% or higher will be awarded one CME credit. For more information on accessing the CME test and claiming credit, please refer to the handout provided in the dashboard on the right side of your screen. Credits for this webinar are approved for physicians, sonographers, and radiologic technologists. During today's presentation, if you have questions for the presenter, you may type them into the question box on the right side of your screen. You will be able to submit questions throughout this webinar, but the presenter will not begin answering until the end of her presentation, at which time she will answer as many questions as possible. A recording of this webinar will be available on the AIUM website. And now I'm pleased to present Michelle Perez. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Uh, I want to say thank you to AIUM and also to Darcy for having me as a webinar presenter today. So as we all know, congenital heart disease is the leading cause of infant mortality. So this mostly attributes to structural cardiac abnormalities most frequently missed during a routine prenatal ultrasound. So here are just a few helpful techniques, um, also tips when evaluating the fetal heart and pearls for an effective screening. I have no disclosures. So there are general considerations to be aware of when screening the fetal heart according to ISWA guidelines. It is gestational age and also technical factors. Technical factors, um, just to mention, high frequency transducers may improve the likelihood of detecting subtle defects at the expense of reduced penetration. Also, low frequency transducers provide adequate penetration, which is also appropriate for your elevated um, body mass index patients or even difficult to scan patients. You also want to keep in mind to optimize and consistently maintain a high frame rate when evaluating cardiac structures to obtain the best optimal imaging. Also, sweeps are highly recommended as you're able to evaluate uh, fetal cardiac structures um, in real time. And also, color Doppler is very helpful to confirm normal versus abnormal, although it is not mandatory. The optimal timing for performing a cardiac screening is between 18 and 22 weeks. So this is um, commonly during the routine anatomy scan. Now some anomalies may be identified during the late first and early second trimester, especially with an increased nuchal translucency. So fetal cardiac screening is generally divided into two groups. We have the basic screening and also the formal fetal echocardiography. So who does this actually apply to? So here we have the basic heart scan, which, or the basic screening, which applies to low risk population and should be part of your routine prenatal care to all pregnant women. And the fetal echocardiography, the formal fetal echo, this is actually for pregnancies at increased risk for congenital heart disease. 
or suspected heart abnormalities that are seen during the routine prenatal scan, requiring a comprehensive evaluation of the fetal heart. So in the past few years, um, these are the, the governing bodies that have taken major steps to improve the effectiveness of screening and detection of congenital heart disease. So clear guidelines um, to include views such as the fetal situs, uh, the four chamber view, the left ventricular alpha tract view, view the, and the RVOT, and also um, the infamous three vessel view and three vessel trachea view um, to be included as part of the comprehensive screening. So we'll review each of these sweeps in detail. So the first step to the sonographic evaluation of the fetal heart is the assessment of fetal situs. So first, let's take a look at the big picture and then work our way in. So here is a sweep just demonstrating the position and the heart in the upper abdomen and in the chest. So this should always be your initial approach as this determines fetal situs. You wanna take a look at the position of the stomach and the heart and the chest. Also careful attention to the location of the aorta, the IVC and um, umbilical vein with portal sinus and not to mention also the gallbladder, the location. This is very helpful in determining abnormal location of abdominal or thoracic organs um, or suspected heterotaxy as in right or left isomerism. So now how do we establish fetal situs? We come in from the sagittal orientation as we see here and document how the baby is lying. You want to rotate 90 degrees and with a sweep, we are actually able to determine which structures are on the right and on the left. So here we could see the stomach is imaged on the left side of the abdomen and the descending aorta is posterior to the left and IVC anterior and to the right. In addition, we could see the umbilical vein connecting to the left portal vein and portal sinus with an L shape to the right. And by sweeping the transducer up to the fetal chest, you can see a four chamber with the apex of the heart pointing to the left. So this is actually correct for breech fetal lie and also confirms correct situs. Now, when evaluating cardiac access and position, you wanna draw a line down the middle, traversing through the right ventricle. The majority of the heart is on the left side and apex leftward with symmetrical lungs. Now, the normal axis is 45 degrees plus or minus 20 degrees. So what do we actually see here? So here we see just a normal four chamber, normal for comparison, and here has a normal axis of 45 degrees. As you look here in this clip, we can see that it's obviously a completely abnormal axis with a heart deviated over towards the left side. So this is about a 90 degree axis deviation. So this is clearly abnormal. So left axis deviation greater than 65 degrees is the most common axis anomaly. So this is associated with congenital heart disease, most especially conotruncal abnormalities such as common arterial trunk, double outlet right ventricle, tetralogy fallot, Epstein's pulmonic stenosis, and coarctation of the aorta. So here, just looking at the four chamber view again, heart is leftward and is over towards to the left side of the chest. But as we see here in this clip, the heart is completely shifted over towards the right. So this is an abnormal position of the heart. This is also otherwise known as cardiac dextro position. So this can be due, due to space occupying lesions such as congenital diaphragmatic hernia, cystic pulmonary adenomatoid malformations, lung hypoplasia or genesis, or even severe pleural fusion. So now that we're done with the bigger picture, we're moving into the four chamber view. So the four chamber view is the most obtainable view during a routine prenatal ultrasound and can be achieved about 95% of fetuses at 18 weeks. 
the four chamber view detects numerous major defects and the sensitivity is about 39%, and this is with a low risk population. So here are just the um, common congenital heart disease associated with an abnormal four chamber view. So you have Epstein's large ventricular septal defects, um, tricuspid pulmonary atresia, TAPVR to name a few. So these are many cardiac abnormalities that are primarily suspected on a four chamber view, and these are all complex cases. So when looking at the four chamber, the heart should occupy one third of the chest. So this is actually assessed as surface area and circumference is about one third to one half of the thoracic cavity in the transverse view. Both values remain constant throughout gestational age. When looking at the four chamber in real time, you also want to assess for any absence of pericardial fusion and pleural fusion. Also, you want to assess how the heart, how the function of the heart, making sure that it's a regular danceable cardiac rhythm and heart rate 120 to about 160 um, beats per minute. So here, um, sometimes you can see a little bit of fluid surrounding the heart, and that can be normal. Now, if you're unsure if the hypocoke space you see is pericardium versus pericardial fusion, why don't you go ahead and just turn on your color Doppler? Since pleural fusion is moving fluid, it will fill with color, as we can see here. So here's an example of a questionable pericardial fusion due to this anechoic space we see here. But when we turn on color Doppler, it does not light up. So there's no fusion, but normal heart tissue. So just a tip, turn color Doppler on to confirm pericardial effusion. So here are the different angle of acquisitions of four chamber views that we commonly see. It's good to evaluate the heart in different views just to assess for symmetry, a symmetry, symmetry, sorry, to focus on specific areas such as the septum, the valves, or even ventricle or atrial morphology. So depending what you want to evaluate. So when looking at the heart, you wanna make sure that the right and the left side of the heart should be symmetrical and also equal size and width. But during the late third trimester, the right ventricle may appear enlarged compared to the left ventricle. This can be a marker for coarctation or any other cardiac abnormalities. On the other hand, the third trimester disproportion can also be a normal variant. What you can do if there's any suspicion for asymmetry, assess the chambers in different views, which can help in confirming chamber disproportion. So another tip, utilize different scan angles when assessing for symmetry. So let's take a closer look at the heart, at the morphology, starting with the right ventricle. So here we have the right ventricle, which is located um, to the anterior chest wall with the moderator band occupying the apical portion and the tricuspid valve, which inserts more apically that is corresponding to the atrioventricular valve for the right ventricle. So this is the characteristic of the right ventricle. And here's just a subcostal view of the fetal heart showing the heavy trabeculations of the right ventricle and the apical insertion of the chordae tendinae of the tricuspid valve to the right ventricular wall, which is also an important morphologic characteristic of the right ventricle. So now when looking at the left ventricle morphology, the left ventricle is posterior to the right ventricle. It is also very smooth walled compared to the right ventricle. And this is due to the fact of no chordae tendinae attachment to the free wall. It is also conical in shape, which makes up the apex of the right ventricle. And also the mitral valve, which is the corresponding atrioventricular valve for the left ventricle.
Now looking at the right atrium, we see the right atrium, which is anterior to the left atrium. In this area, the IVC and the SVC drains into the right atrium. Also, the coronary sinus drains into the right atrium. Uh, sometimes uh, we are able to see the coronary sinus in the four-chamber view if it's dilated. So because of this, it courses along the atrial ventricular groove of the left atrium. We can see, we could, we could actually see if, um, if it's enlarged on the four-chamber view. We are also able to see sometimes the eustachian valve. So the eustachian valve, um, this is just a normal anatomic finding. This is located at the opening of the IVC. Now, if prominent, we are able to see it in the four-chamber view. This directs highly oxygenated blood originating from the ductus venosus to the foramen ovale. And this can sometimes be mistaken for the flap of the foramen ovale. So that's something to keep in mind. This is also commonly seen in the bicaval view. Now moving into the left atrial morphology. So the left atrium is the most posterior chamber. And here we also see the descending aorta, which is behind the left atrium with no vessels in between. You also want to keep in mind the proximal distance of the descending aorta, descending aorta with the left atrium. We also see the foramen or valley flapping from right to left and also the, pul the pulmonary veins, which are slit-like um, structures actually entering into the posterior wall of the left atrium. So I just want to take a moment uh, just to focus on the pulmonary veins. So it's, it's very important to identify the pulmonary veins, specifically in a four-chamber view. Um, these are the two inferior pulmonary veins. Uh, so this can actually be obtained by angling your probe along the left atrial posterior wall. Um, optimization is a key to visualizing these small vessels in grayscale imaging. And also you want to decrease your, your sector width and increase your dynamic range for more contrast, which may possibly help. So here we see pulmonary veins at 18 weeks and five days and also 24 weeks and four days. So the, you can see the pulmonary veins are seen as small slit-like openings in the posterior wall of the left atrium. So in grayscale, you, this can actually be achieved and you can actually see it. Now, what do we actually see here? Is this normal or abnormal? So just to let you know that this clip was purposely slowed down. So we see what looks like pulmonary veins right behind the left atrium, but the presence of a confluent vein behind the left atrium. And also, if you notice, the increased distance between the descending aorta and the left atrium. Also, the slightly enlarged um, right side of the heart and also slight balding of the left atrium. So this obviously is abnormal. There are no pulmonary veins that enter the left atrium. And just going from the subcostal view, in order to view this area clearly, here we could actually see the confluent vein. So this is otherwise known, or based on studies, this is they call this the twig sign. And that's uh, something to keep in mind when actually taking a look at the pulmonary veins. And applying colored Doppler, you can see what may appear like true pulmonary veins draining into the left atrium and can get interpreted as normal, most especially if color settings are not optimal. In this case, identifying the pulmonary veins in grayscale and making sure you see the slit-like openings into the posterior wall of the left atrium was key in identifying uh, this abnormality. And of course, this ended up being a uh, total anomalous pulmonary venous return and for cardiac. Okay, so now going back into the left atrial morphology, here we see actually this specific structure. People wonder like, is that thrombus? Um, it has also been referred to us for a possibly um, dilated coronary sinus, but what is that exactly? So this is just a normal anatomic structure called the Coumadin ridge. So the Coumadin ridge, otherwise known as the Warfarin ridge, is what separates the left atrial appendage and the left superior pulmonary vein. 
This can actually be frequently seen on the left lateral wall of the left atrium, as we could see here. Now, lack of mobility and characteristic location just helps distinguish it from an abnormal finding. What you could do also is also turn on color and you could see the left superior pulmonary vein um, tracking adjacent to it. Now moving into valve morphology. So the tricuspid valve is slightly apically offset from the mitral valve, so that's something to note. So this represents a very important anatomic feature that is typically absent in atrial ventricular septal defects. So that's something to pay attention to. Also, when looking at the valves, you want to see the valves move freely, um, come and go in systole and diastole. And also it helps assessing the valves also from a different angle. Again, you want to see the valves move freely and come and go in systole and diastole. Now, in this clip, is this a normal or abnormal? So here we do see an offset, but I think this offset is too much. So clearly this is abnormal. Now in comparison with the normal core chamber, here we see the tricuspid valve, that's a normal offset. But in this case, here we have the tricuspid valve, which is closer to the apex of the heart. It's more of an exaggerated offset. But let's go ahead and get a closer look. So here we have the normal offset of the tricuspid valve. And in this case, you see the complete displacement of the tricuspid valve. And clearly you could see the difference. So this is abnormal. And with color Doppler, here we're actually able to see the, um, the regurgitation due to the defective valve. So this ended up being a mild form of Epstein's anomaly. So we utilize color, color Doppler to assess the mitral valve and tricuspid valve inflow. So you want to do this in an apical four-chamber view since your angle of incination is parallel to the direction of blood flow. You want to make sure that your scale should be set to high with a PRF greater than 50 centimeters per second. And you also want to keep the color, blocks, color box small to maintain a high frame rate and flow should be from the atria to the ventricle. And normal flow is smooth laminar flow with no evidence of leakage. So now, what do we actually see wrong here? With color Doppler assessment of this four chamber, we can see moderate tricuspid regurgitation. When you see this, you want to think, well, is there a problem with the atrial ventricular valve or is there a problem that's downstream causing the increased pressure? And so here's in grayscale, and as you can see, this is due to the defective valve. And this ended up a thickened tricuspid valve with regurgitation. So again, valve should come and go with the cardiac cycle. Also, another pitfall when looking at the four chamber view is as you're scanning, you're wondering, well, is this a questionable VSD? Or is this a dropout that is due to the septum being parallel to the beam? What you can do is you have to change your angle of acquisition and scan perpendicular to the septum. And here, of course, we don't see any VSD. So which brings us to the subcostal view. So in the subcostal view, here we're able to see the atrial septum. We're also able to assess the crux of the heart. We're able to see the septum is intact, forming a valley flapping from right to left. Also a great view to view the pulmonary veins due to your great angle of incination. And here we're able to also see the descending aorta behind the left atrium. So when evaluating the septum, you wanna keep in mind to change your angle of acquisition so the septum is perpendicular to the beam. 
Also, when using color Doppler, you want to drop your scale to a PRF of, le of at least less than 30 centimeters per second. And do you want to pan through the septum? Remember, septum has depth. So in this subcostal clip of the heart, we can see a normal interventricular septum on grayscale. But once we turn color on, here we can actually identify a small VSD with bidirectional shunting. So color Doppler is very helpful in detecting small VSDs, and particularly less than two millimeters that we can't see on grayscale. So again, optimize your scanning angle and turn on color Doppler to assess for septal defects, especially the small ones. Now here, um, is just demonstrating that VSDs greater than two to three millimeters are visible on grayscale, as you can see here. And as you can see, we are not in the traditional septal view, but more looking into the left ventricular outflow tract view. Remember, the septum has depth and it has a curvilinear surface. And borders of the VSD commonly appear echogenic, as you can see here. This is an important hint to differentiating a true muscular VSD from an artifact. Now, that's another great tip. And of course, with color, um, just confirms the presence of uh, the defect in the bidirectional shunting. Remember again, septum has depth. So now moving into the left ventricular outflow tract. So outflow tracts, just the facts. So outflow tract lesions predominate and they require early intervention and it's just due to these ductal dependent lesions that need to be paid attention to. Um, there has been studies shown that um, with outflow tracts, uh, we are able to detect many congenital heart abnormalities, especially the coronal truncal type. So this shows that with doing outflow tracts, we have better detection of congenital heart disease. Now the defects of the great vessels are associated with an abnormal four chamber view in about 30% of cases. And here's just a common congenital heart disease associated with a normal four chamber view, such as tetralogy for low, transposition of the great arteries, double outlet right ventricle, aortic arch abnormalities, and common arterial trunk. So these are all complex abnormalities of the heart. So just going through the normal structures of the left ventricular outflow tract. So here we have the left ventricle, the ascending aorta, aortic valve, the ventricular septum, right ventricle, left atrium, mitral valve, and the descending aorta right behind the left atrium. Also, just to note, left ventricle gives rise to the aorta. You also want to take a look and make sure the aorta is normal in caliber. Also, the continuity of the wall of the aorta with the mitral valve leaflet and the continuity of the interventricular septum with the wall of the aorta, which actually creates this nice wide angle. And that's normal. And also, when assessing the left ventricular alpha tract, you want to also assess the valves. You want to make sure that the mitral valve and the aortic valves should move freely and come and go in systole and diastole. Now, when evaluating the left ventricular alpha tract with color Doppler, scale should be set to high with a PRF greater than 50 centimeters per second. You wanna keep your color block small to maintain the high frame rate and flow should be from the left ventricle to the aorta. Now, normal flow is smooth laminar flow with, eh, with no evidence of turbulence. Now here's just um, two LVOTs obtained in different views. So it's very important to become familiar with anatomic structures not presented in the traditional views, um, as this will help you recognize abnormal structures, especially in the setting of a difficult exam. So just adjusting your angle of acquisition, you could actually get different views of the left ventricular outflow tract.
So here's a sweep from the subcostal view in which the beam is perpendicular to the septum. Here we're able to assess the septum for the paramembranous, um, paramembranous BSDs. Also, we are able to, in this view, assess for any possible aortic override. We're able to see the continuity of the anterior wall of the aorta with the interventricular septum and also the posterior wall of the aorta with the mitral valve. And also, we are able to assess the aortic valve as they come and go in cystine diastole and they're like thin, delicate leaflets. I believe this view over time has become one of my favorite views since you're able to assess all these specific areas in just this one plain view. And with, with color Doppler, to assess flow across the aortic valve, you want a high PRF of greater than 50 centimeters per second. Also, you want to assess the septum using, utilizing a low PRF of less than 30 centimeters per second. And normal flow is smooth laminar flow through the aortic valve. So looking at this left ventricular alpha tract, is this normal or abnormal? Here we could actually see the valves, but it does not look like they're coming and going with the circulation, almost like they're staying in view. Now let's go ahead and get a closer look. So this ended up having thickened and doming of the aortic valve. So this is clearly abnormal. And with color Doppler, here you could actually see um, severe leakage from the aortic valve, and this ended up having severe aortic stenosis. Again, you want to pay attention to the valves, and you want to see them come and go with um, in Sicily and diastole. So here we have a normal left ventricular outflow tract with an intact interventricular septum and continuity of the anterior wall of the aorta. In comparison to this clip, we see a large paramembranous defect and discontinuity of the anterior wall of the aorta, which is abnormal. And here you could actually see and appreciate the defect. So this is abnormal. This is an overriding aorta with a VSD. And with color Doppler, just to confirm and just facilitate the demonstration of the VSD and the overriding aorta. Now moving into the right ventricular outflow tract. So here, just going over the normal anatomic views, we have the right ventricle, tricuspid valve, right atrium, pulmonic valve, aorta, the cross-section view of the aorta, pulmonary artery, ductus arteriosus, um, the right pulmonary artery wrapping around the aorta. In this view, we don't see the left pulmonary artery, which is not seen in this view. When assessing the right ventricular outflow tract, you want to um, take a look at the PA and make sure the PA is greater, if not equal to the aorta. And also you wanna be able to assess the pulmonic valve that it's moving freely and coming and going with circulation. And here we're able to see the, the branch PAs here, main pulmonary artery branch, such as the left pulmonary artery and the right pulmonary artery. These are important anatomic characteristics that differentiates it from the ascending aorta. So this is very important to note and remember. And with color Doppler, scale should be set to high with a PRF greater than 50 centimeters per second. You also wanna keep the color box small to maintain a high frame rate and flow should be from the right ventricle to the PA. And again, normal flow is smooth and laminar flow. So here in a normal fetus, you can see the pulmonary trunk is slightly larger, if not greater or equal to the size of the aorta and divides into the right and left pulmonary artery. In comparison to this right ventricular outflow tract, 
here you can see a little bit of subpulmonic narrowing in comparison to the aorta. So this is obviously abnormal. You can see the huge disproportion. Another tip, the PA should never be smaller than the aorta. And we turn on color Doppler to, to demonstrate any retrograde flow caused by the narrowing. But in this case, there is normal antegrade flow with subpulmonic narrowing. So here is a sweep, um, the crossing of the great vessels, otherwise known as a sweep, starting in the subcostal view and going into the long axis of the right ventricular alpha tract. So in the sweep technique, you can verify the crossing of the great vessels and at the level of the valves. And you can also visualize the valves clearly and also moving freely. Another tip, great vessels should cross at the level of the valves. And I'll actually, we'll actually break down this clip as it is moving kind of quickly here. So this has, two, this is also one of my favorite views as we're able to, to see the valves moving, we're also able to determine crossing. So in this sweep here, we're able to see the, there's the left ventricular outflow tract during the aortic valve. Here it's coming into the pulmonic valve and going up to the three vessel trachea view. And color Doppler is particularly helpful in this view. So as you sweep through the great vessels, they actually display different colors, which confirms the crossing. And this is basically due to the respective positions of the vessels in the near parallel course with the angle of incination. So just breaking it down, here we have the pulmonary artery, which is blue. And then you have the aorta, just going back to the spine, which is red. And just confirming crossing. And this is just an example of an um, apical approach sweep if the fetus is in the ideal supine position. Again, you could just starting off from the four chamber, going all the way up to the three vessel view. And just breaking down the sweeps. Here we have the normal four chamber, the left ventricular alpha tract, and going up higher to baby's neck, you see a three vessel view. So it's a very helpful <clears throat> technique when actually evaluating uh, the heart with just a single sweep. So here we, this was a case that uh, one of the sonographers came and was actually explaining, well, I can't seem to get the crossing. I don't know what's wrong. So here, as you can see, we see what looks like a four chamber view, but we are unable to see that crossing as we go up to the neck. So obviously this is abnormal we don't see any vessels crossing. And this baby ended up having transposition of the great arteries. So here you could actually see uh, going from an angle, an oblique angle, you're able to capture the um, parallel orientation of the great arteries from the right ventricle, the aorta is arising from the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery arising from the left ventricle. Now moving into the uh, three vessel view, three vessel trachea view. So I'm going to just touch up briefly on this as I know that there is another excellent webinar out there about the three vessel view. So this is just a very helpful view that we use frequently at our lab and also a very important plane for the great vessels. So if you have not yet started on using the three vessel view and three vessel trachea view, I recommend that you start trying. So the three vessel, three vessel trachea view um, is very helpful view as it's able to detect abnormalities in the upper mediastinum. It also allows to identify critical heart defects affecting the outflow tracts and the aortic arch. And is also very easy to obtain throughout gestation. Now 
Now, how do I actually get the three vessel view? First, you want to obtain a four chamber view and move cephalid. And here you can actually see in this clip moving into the three vessel view. Now, how about the three vessel trachea view? You want to angle your probe a few millimeters towards the fetal head. And with a very simple sweep starting from the four chamber and angling up towards the head, this very small three second sweep, we're able to rule out major congenital heart uh, disease, even more so if you were to apply colored Doppler in interrogating these areas. So just reviewing the anatomical components of the three vessel view. So here we have the main pulmonary artery, which continues to the ductus, the ascending aorta. We have the superior vena cava and as well as the trachea. Now, in order to remember this um, better, this, otherwise this we could call this past. So the pulmonary artery, aorta, SVC, and the trachea. So these vessels should be oriented from left to right, anterior to posterior with an oblique orientation, largest to smallest. The PA is larger, if not slightly equal to the aorta and the SBC being the smallest. And remember, vessels are arranged in an oblique line. And here's just showing again the three vessel view with pulmonary artery branching as we were able to see that earlier with the right ventricular alpha tract. So here, this is, it's a very useful view as this confirms just branch pulmonary arteries are confluent. So normally the, the right pulmonary artery, uh, we see pretty easy as it courses posterior to the aorta. The left pulmonary artery can be a little challenging. So it's a small little vessel here since the ductus um, arterios actually overlaps it as we move up to the chest. But with a slight angulation, you're able to actually tease out and see this left pulmonary artery. So moving a few, milli few millimeters from the three vessel view and slightly oblique, we move into the three vessel trachea view. So looking at the structures here, you could see the ductal aortic arteries merge into the descending aorta. So this is actually what forms the V configuration or V shape. So the orientation of the aorta and ductal arches being left to the trachea define them as both the left ductal arch and left aortic arch. So this is a view that you're able to detect um, arch anomalies, which I'll actually mention in the next few slides. And here we have the SVC, the superior vena cava. And not to mention the trachea. It's always good to note where the trachea is at when looking at the three vessel trachea view. And the thymus, which is also um, very helpful to detect as um, an absent or a hypoplastic thymus is also a marker for CHD, uh, specifically deletion 22Q. So what, what are you going to look, what do you ask yourself when actually assessing the three vessel, three vessel trick of you? You want to ask yourself, are the configuration of the vessels correct? Is PA greater, if not equal to the aorta, and the aorta greater than SVC in size? Is there a correct number of vessels, which there should be only three vessels? Is flow direction towards the descending aorta? And is it a correct arch-sidedness? So when looking at flow direction of the three vessel view, it is anti-grade flow in both grade vessels, and there should be smooth laminar flow. Reversal flow in either vessel is abnormal. So that's something to keep in mind when looking at three vessel and three vessel trachea view. Now, if you see any reversal flow, then this will prompt you to interrogate all the remaining um, vessels or remaining views of the heart. So just looking at this clip, where is actually the V? 
So here we see a normal three vessel trachea view, just for comparison. And we have the trachea here, but we actually see a U configuration. So this shows a right aortic arch with a transverse aortic arch to the right side of the trachea, therefore forming this U configuration. So this is abnormal. And here we see a normal uh, three vessel view. For comparison, we have the PA aorta and SVC. Now, what do we see here? We only see two vessels. So this is abnormal. This is an abnormal vessel number. This ended up being a transposition of the great arteries. So as we further scan a little bit inferior to where we were at earlier, as we look at as we look, there are three vessels actually present, but configured abnormally. So here we have the PA, aorta, and the SVC. We have the aorta, which is anterior, the pulmonary artery, which is posterior, and you can identify the branch pulmonary arteries in SVC. So that's how we're able to determine this is the pulmonary artery. And here's the SVC. So this fetus has transposition of the great arteries. So this is abnormal configuration of the three vessel view. and just a schematic drawing of a normal three vessel view versus the transposition of the great arteries. So just a few key points to keep in mind when screening the heart, you want to recognize normal structures in order to recognize um, the abnormals. You also wanna pay close attention to the valves. Remember, valves come and go. Also, the importance of including outflow tracts and the three-vessel view and three-vessel trach view in your studies. Also, sweeps are very, very helpful as we're able to evaluate the cardiac structures in real time. Also, don't be afraid to use color Doppler. If color Doppler is something that you're not used to actually applying, practice makes perfect. And you know, with every scan that you do, you could actually apply color just to and try to practice. Also utilize different scan plays and techniques and uh, to adjust the correct angle of exposition in which you're, you're able to, depending what structure you're trying to evaluate. Thank you. Okay, I believe we have at least one question. Do you see it, Michelle, or should I? Yes. Okay. Should the LVOT and the right ventricular alpha tract be obtained on all scans? Yes, according to the guidelines currently, the AUM guidelines and also the uh, ISMA guidelines, the LVOT and the RVOT are part of the, um, the basic screening guidelines. They should be included on all scans. Um, I guess you were very thorough. Are there any other questions? Here we go. Are there specific programs to learn fetal echo? I believe the um, AIUM does have specific parameters that you could find online. Uh, to learn how to do the fetal echoes. Um, I, I believe that there's one, there's actually a for fetal echo parameters. So you can find that online at the uh, online website for American Institute of Ultrasound Medicine. <laughs> Very helpful resources on there. It looks like there's another um, question. What length of cine clips do you recommend as sweeping through the heart? I would say around three seconds. Three seconds, three to four seconds when actually sweeping through each view. Hopefully your institution has a really good archive system so nothing breaks down due to the amount of clips that you'll take. Also, does 3D help in fetal echo? 3D may be very helpful um, to include as a, uh, a supplement to fetal echo. As you know, with 3D, we are, we are able to, to see structures, um, but the only 
downfall if there were three days that the resolution does get distorted. Any other questions? Oh, here, there's more. You should, yeah. Yes, I just did. I'm so sorry. Is it mandatory to 3D scan? Um, it is not mandatory, but studies have shown that it's very helpful to include as part of your scan. And the question is, what is the yield of the three-vessel view with a normal four chamber and optic track? Well, the three-vessel view, it allows you to look at the upper and mediastinum, so especially in particular the three-vessel trachea view. So without the three-vessel trachea view, um, and if you're only doing the outflow tracks and the four chamber, sometimes you won't be able to determine arch sidedness. So the three-vessel trachea view is very helpful in determining arch sidedness. We're looking at vessels that are up in the mediastinum area that we're not able to really assess with the outflow tracks. Oh, there's one more. Is there any specific distance between the tricuspid valve and mitral valve be used for Epstein Romney? That is a very good question. I think I asked a pediatric cardiologist one time that same question. Um, I know that there are papers out there in terms of a specific distance. Um, I, I don't have that. I, I don't have that right now in mind. Um, but I know that there is a paper out there. If you could leave me your email, I could actually email you back with more of the information. But I believe that just by eyeballing the tricuspid valve, it you know it is slightly more apical. But if there's an exaggerated distance between the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve, then that should be concerning. That's pretty much it. I think we have a few more questions rolling in. I don't know if there's a delay getting them to you. If, if doing the four chamber and outflow tracks with three vessel view, is it important to get the long axis of the arch and ductal arch for spooling? It is important to include for the detail examination. So for example, with, uh, with fetal echo, it's very essential to include those views. With the basic views, I believe the four chamber just with the alpha tracks and the three vessel view is what, uh, is, what is actually going to include. Um, but getting the long axis of the arch and the ductal arch, that is more for a comprehensive review. So that's more of a fetal echo cardiography um, formal scan. I answer the whole questions. And then we have one that um, someone's saying they're still a little confused on how to determine PDA. I'm still confused on how to determine the patent ductus arteriosus. Is that what they're talking about? The patent ductus arteriosus? You mean to determine between the ductus arteriosus and the. I'm not really quite understanding that question. All right, well, maybe they'll, um, they'll write again with some clarity. If you're talking about just the ductus arteriosus, um, how to determine, you have to go in a ductal arch view and you're able to see the ductal arch view. If that's what they're talking about. I'm not too sure how specific. Okay. And Oh, and here we have someone asking you to define the septum depth. So the septum, as you can see, you know, just looking at a normal model of the heart, the, the septum itself, um, it pretty much covers, you know, a, a good amount of area. And it's it's very curvilinear surface. So just by looking at when we do an ultrasound, like in the four chamber, typically the way the beam, you know, transects the heart, we're only covering a small portion of that heart. In order to thoroughly evaluate the septum, you want to scan, you know, you know, anterior to posterior to the heart to be able to cover the septum. All right. Great questions, though. I think that, yeah, and I think, um, I think that wraps up our, our webinar for today. Um, thank you very much.
Michelle, and on behalf of the AIUM, our thanks to all of you who participated in today's webinar. Uh, please remember to complete the post-test and the activity evaluation. And we hope you enjoyed this presentation and will join us again for future webinars. So long, everyone. <laughs>